The urinary system, which we're continuing today, is chapter 26. And chapter 26 is about a system that exists primarily because we do one thing, and that is eat protein. Because we eat protein, we get our amino acids from our diet for all of our protein production, our protein building. We also use proteins for, um, for nutrition. And the first thing our body does when it's going to use that carbon fragment for metabolism is to strip that amine group off. So it produces ammonia. Ammonia in water is very deadly to cells. So our body makes urea out of it in the liver and then circulates it to the kidneys for this three-step process. The functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. And in the nephron, we're going to do a totally liquid job. No precipitation, no grains uh, are, are uh, present in a healthy kidney. That produces kidney stones. If you have kidney stones, it's very, very painful when they move. But the reason that everything is so tiny is that it greatly increases the surface area of membrane. And that means capillary walls, that means nephron walls, because we're going to have to do very, very difficult chemical exchange. The higher the surface area, the more processing and the more urea extraction and concentration can occur. It's a three-step process, starting in the glomerulus with filtration, and then after the glomerulus in the proximal tubule, in the loop of, of uh, Henle, or the nephron loop, it's sometimes called, in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, we have these two processes. Sorry, I don't have my pointer on. Reabsorption is the movement of additional materials or valuable materials like glucose, like ions, like hormones from the filtrate back into the bloodstream. And that can occur really anywhere along here. Secretion is the reverse, moving materials that are waste. Hydrogen ion is a great example. When we're carrying a lot of extra hydrogen ion and our pH is challenged, we can basically actively move that hydrogen ion back to the urine. And that's called secretion. So that occurs in the well, everything after the glomerulus, let's take a look at that process. Here's filtration. The blood pressure is high. The blood flows in and flows through this knot of capillaries and right back out. All the red blood cells, white blood cells, the large cells that are flowing with the blood, and the large proteins that are circulating are too small to go through the hole, so they come right back out. But anything small gets pushed out in some concentration into this uh, yellow colored area inside the glomerulus. It is actual holes, pores, that cause this initial separation. So that means it comes out with water. All the ions, sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, they all get pushed out. Even glucose gets pushed out. We don't want to lose glucose. So it's clear to see that the filtrate contains a water solution of small ions produced by filtration. Reabsorption is going to be based on the active transport carriers that are present in the walls of the uh, nephron loop, meaning that there are going to be specific carriers that can either passively or actively move things out. Well, sodium is reabsorbed actively, meaning ATP is being used to move sodium. Potassium and chloride follow by diffusion and co-transport within the nephron tubules. Nutrients are reabsorbed by facilitated diffusion, meaning that the filtrate's coming down with, as an example, high levels of blood glucose. There are specific carriers that are going to pump that glucose out of the filtrate and place it in a position where it can be reabsorbed by the blood. Water is going to be moved by osmosis. And here it's key to remember that saying, pump the ions and the water follows. 
So as we get down below the glomerulus, starting with the proximal convoluted tubules, and there are specific zones of transport. So specific things are moved in specific regions. As we pump that stuff across out of the nephron tubule, we're going to concentrate the ions around that tubule and lower the water concentration. That means water is going to follow along behind. Secretion is when we move from the blood to the urine. Hydrogen ions for pH control, especially in the distal tubule and the collecting duct. Various waste products are also pumped out of the uh, filtrate, including urea. Now, here's an interesting use that the body makes of this waste product. It is a waste product. You don't want it wandering around the body, but if you pump it out around the nephron tubules, you affect the osmotic pressure. So as you pump more and more urea around it, especially down around the collecting duct, pump a lot of urea into the material around the collecting duct and it pulls water out of the filtrate, giving you your final concentration. Also important is the kidney's reaction to certain drugs. Sometimes we will uh, perform something like, and we learned this from the mechanical artificial kidneys, as we uh, cleaned a person's blood up, as they were waiting for a kidney donation that was compatible with their immune system, as we clean them up, they're on a machine, and the drugs that they're being that are being used at the same time often are removed by the kidneys. The idea of this drawing is to illustrate the difference in ion concentration. So up here in the cortex, the rim is where we have the le least concentration of solute around the tubules. Notice as we as we dip down into the medulla, it goes from light pink to medium pink to dark red, and that's because of the pattern of reabsorption that's occurring. Notice how in the proximal tubule there will be a specific useful metabolites up here in the cortex that are just transported out. Their high concentration allows them to move out easily. But down here, look at this, water is being uh, uh, pumped out all the way down the descending arm, which is going to do what? It's going to concentrate the solutes. When you turn to the ascending arm of the loop of Henle or the nephron loop that dips into the medulla, you'll notice there are carriers for sodium chloride in molecular form down here below the dotted line, and then up, up higher, co-transport for sodium and chloride. So we're basically creating a very salty area down here. But as we move down, we pump out water. As we move back up, we pump down salt. So the concentration of urea and other metabolites is not that different. Now, through this distal tubule, more water is lost. And through the distal tubule, there will be specific transport of metabolites. We'll talk about that in, in detail later. But as you get here to the collecting duct and descend through the pyramid, through the medulla region, toward that uh, point of the cone, the one that hooks to the calyx, we're going to pump out more water for final concentration of the urine. We're going to pump out urea to reinforce this osmotic pull so that water is pulled out and is retained. Um, increased solute concentration causes more diffusion of the water from the nephron loop in the collecting duct. So it is reclaiming that water that's important. We're already passing a lot of water by using a liquid urine. We mentioned before that birds and reptiles use a uh, either uh, or fish, just get rid of the ammonia directly, or they precipitate their urea as uric acid, a solid form for excretion. We don't. We use a totally, um, uh, a totally uh, liquid form. The blood volume and blood pressure, of course, then is directly related by how much water you're sending out. So we're going to see a couple of regulatory mechanisms, some of which have been mentioned before. 
Antidiuretic hormone, a direct product of the hypothalamus, is going to affect the permeability of this system, and especially over here in the collecting duct. Because its name is antidiuretic, that means against the release of water. Antidiuretic hormone, its effect on the collecting duct is going to be to pump, uh, to basically uh, open it up so that more and more urea is pumped and more and more water leaves. So ADH is going to cause the volume of urine to go down and the concentration to go up. It is a water retention mechanism. This is showing that. Here we have the filtration going on. No ADH is present. Notice the basically the uh, spacing of the dot shows you the concentration of this solid group. So coming down this loop, notice with the water being pulled out by that osmotic gradient, the solutes get much, much more concentrated, but there's so much sodium and chloride in our body. Something that's present, we eat salt to maintain that. So as we pump back up the ascending loop, we're pumping that salt out into this medium and diluting the solutes that are carried. Now, by the time we get to here, we've reclaimed most of that useful stuff like glucose and uh, um, sodium chloride, um, calcium, magnesium, all of those things. And you notice it's dilute again in the distal convoluted tubule. Without ADH, there is no uh, additional concentration of the urine and high volumes of low uh, concentration or dilute urine is passed. But what happens if your water balance is affected by a uh, lack of drinking? You're dehydrating your body. And as you get here, ADH is released and its effect here on the collecting duct is to open up these passageways so that water can diffuse out. So you'll notice from this dilute condition up here, as it descends down the collecting duct for final collection to the transport to the bladder, we're concentrating that urine and making a small volume of urine for release from the body. Uh, the urine is something we pass out on a regular basis, and as a result, it's something that's chemically very interesting. You can tell a lot from urine samples. So one of the things that, uh, when I worked at the zoo, one of the things that we were interested in doing was breeding the animals that were in our collection so we didn't have to extract animals from the wild. But how do you tell when female mammals are uh, receptive to breeding? Many of them are seasonal. The simple answer was to collect their urine and look for the presence of hormones in the urine. Now you'll notice how the plasma of the blood, this column represents a good estimate of the homeostatic range for each of these ions. So 135 to 145 milliequivalent per liter is a good estimate of the amount of sodium we carry. 100 to 108 is the chloride. Now, these two are interesting because the only thing that's not alive that we eat regularly is salt. Notice the high levels of sodium and chloride we have. Salt is critical to our osmotic balance. But in the urine, look at the wide range. We can put out urine with as low as 40 milliequivalents, as high as 220. So it shows the differential effect of the kidneys. Likewise, chloride as low as 110 and as high as 250 for chloride elimination. Potassium is a relatively low concentration in our plasma because most of the potassium is inside the cells, but the urine can actually contain up to 20 times that maximum amount uh, when potassium is oversupplied. Down here, metabolites. Look at this. This particular middle section gives us an important lesson about those substances that we use as nutrients. Glucose. As a representative of the carbohydrates, they list 70 to 110 in plasma and 0 0.009 or 9 one thousandths of 1% in the urine. That's a negligible amount. Most tests don't pick it up. Likewise, 
Our body does not turn loose of lipids, even though our milligrams of circulating lipids, look at that total amount, 450 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams circulating lipids, very, very high. That's that fatty acid content for energy, 0.002%. Amino acids uh, in our plasma, 40. We don't really, we release hardly any. And finally, protein, six to eight grams of proteins per deciliter, because so many of those are our own protein. Um, the proteins, uh, actin and myosin in hemoglobin, and uh, I'm sorry, not actin and myosin, the, the protein hemoglobin accounts for a lot of those, but none released. So, Basically, if we put a nutrient in our body, we either store it or we use it, or we, in one way or another, we don't really let it go. Nitrogenous waste, look at the concentration of urea. So we want to keep it low in the blood, so its effect on our living cells is minimized, but we can concentrate up to 1,800 milligrams per deciliter, 1.8 grams of urea per deciliter. Creatinine, from creatinine phosphate fame, uh, up to 150. Uric acid, by the way, these are all in an equilibrium. They are never completely eliminated, and they exist in equilibrium with one another. But uric acid can be concentrated in our urine. And finally, ammonia. Look at that super low concentration of ammonia that is maintained. But we can really concentrate that up. We can, if, if a lot of nitrogen is in our body, we can send that ammonia out directly. Oops. Okay, I'm back. We do see a direct interaction between our urinary system and the um, uh, blood pressure and blood volume that was so critical to our ongoing homeostasis. Blood pressure and blood volume are kind of behind all of these metabolic considerations of homeostatic ranges. So if we're losing blood pressure, it's a serious thing. Blood pressure and volume drop and we get a response because of the blood flow to the kidney is reduced and the oxygen delivery is reduced. So you, you're suffering from a mild hypoxia uh, in the kidneys. The kidney responds by releasing erythropoietin, which is generated in the juxtaglomerular apparatus, to increase red blood cell production and increase the sediment or the hematocrit of the blood to increase blood pressure. Now, this is the long-term response to lower blood pressure, and it will have an effect in a matter of days. Renin release is immediate, and it leads to this ca that cascade of hormones, angiotensinogen, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, and to the tropical to triple release of aldosterone, which increases sodium retention, ADH from the hypothalamus, and the behavioral response that we get thirsty. So what happens? These upper two pathways lead to increased fluid retention. So concentrate that urine to the maximum amount, whereas the simple effect of stimulating the thirst is just to find a couple of liter bottles, <clears throat> liter bottles of water and drink them. What that means is that we're going to increase our blood volume directly and uh, bring it back up. If, it, if the hematocrit drops somewhat, then um, it, it's less important than actually getting uh, the blood volume back up so that heart pumping pressure and uh, the movement of materials around the body is happening at normal rates. The juxtaglomerular apparatus is right here near the glomerulus, right where that afferent feeding of blood to the filtration step in the efferent flow can be monitored by chemoreceptors. Erythropoietin and renin are released from here. 
erythropoiesis for red blood cell production, renin for fluid retention. Um, erythropoietin we've mentioned a couple of times. It's a peptide hormone, pretty small, and it's released when oxygen is low, and we know its red blood cell effect on the um, on the uh, uh, red bone marrow. We've talked a lot about dropping our blood pressure and seen a number of factors that respond uh, over different courses of time in order to restore it. But we haven't talked much about rising blood pressure. And that's where atrial natriuretic peptide comes in handy. Now the name tells you, atrial tells you where it's uh, produced. Natri is the word for natrium, which is the Greek word for sodium. That's why it's Na on the periodic table. And uretic is like diuretic, the release. So it's against the release of sodium. Retain the sodium, you retain the water. Peptide tells you it's made of amino acids. It uh, basically, to summarize its effect, all of those effects of ADH and aldosterone from the angiotensin and the um, renin cascade are countered by atrial natriuretic peptide. It's released by the heart when blood volume is uh, high, when blood pressure is high. And what it essentially does is shut down that water retention. Uh, it shuts off that uh, red blood cell production and it increases water loss from the kidney. So basically our, our volume of our, uh, I'm sorry, our concentration of our urine goes way down and the volume of water released goes way up. No better way to decrease the volume of the blood quickly. Now, we've already talked about osmosis being important and that's not water or salt, that's the two of them together. So the important thing is the relative concentration. So we have to regulate our salt levels in order to maintain that proper osmotic balance. This affects everything from the glomerulus through the nephron and water extraction. The thing to remember, water follows salt. So we may have a specific mechanism that takes sodium chloride and pumps it out of the filtrate. That takes ATP. As it does that, the water follows behind. That's the effect of osmosis. And so it does have a direct effect on blood pressure, a healthy, balanced kidney with good hydration levels. The kidney does have also a direct effect on pH, and we've seen pH effects before related, related basically to the fact we are a water-based metabolism that deals with carbon dioxide all the time. So when we produce CO2, we go through carbonic acid to bicarbonate and, and hydrogen ion. And we then have to deal with this amount of hydrogen ion. This is showing the balanced effects from the kidney tubule where ammonium is, uh, ammonia is soaking up hydrogen and forming ammonium in the urine um, hydrogen ion can then be transported from the blood into the urine by active transport in order to remove excess hydrogen ion uh, from the body. Now the other place obviously where we remove it is the lungs by breathing harder. So uh, when we reverse this, absorb this hydrogen ion, drive it over here, we breathe this out, the water is left behind. Now, in addition to the respiratory system and the urinary system, which act to actually shove the hydrogen ion out of the body, we always have to recognize the carrying effect of the cardiovascular system. The hydrogen ion is picked up, and the carbon dioxide is picked up from its area of production and transported either to the lungs or to the kidneys, where it can be eliminated. By the way, another transport that occurs here, a reabsorption is the alkaline tide of bicarbonate ion back into the blood. So here we have basic overview of, 
uh, body pH control. We can eliminate hydrogen ion when pH is dropping, eliminate hydrogen ion by uh, uh, the uh, acidifying the urine. And uh, for those pH controls of, of fluids in the body, we'll examine this again. And we find the most variable fluid is urine. You can have urine that's pH 4. If you have a recurring burning sensation when you urinate, it may be because of an unusual pH. Um, over here in the lungs, the respiration rate and the depth, depth of respiration, which is expelling that CO2, is leaving water behind, which has a moderating effect on the pH. Carrying around, we've seen the effect of the red blood cell, the erythrocyte and its carbonic anhydrase, it, which actually produces these uh, carbonic acid moieties along with bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So overall, the actual place we dump it is the uh, lungs and the kidney, but the connection of the cardiovascular system is important as well. So this is a very busy diagram, I'll admit that. One of the reasons I like it very much is that it takes all the slides that have preceded this one and summarizes them in some way. If you can look at this figure and really understand everything it says and every part of it, if you can remember these summary statements that are boxed, then you really do understand the nephron and how it works. And this is the functional unit of how the urinary system produces urine. So I want you to notice a couple of things. Blue arrows are water movement, and you notice water movement all over the place. It leaves by filtration, and then uh, uh, it leaves the blood by filtration, and basically we're reclaiming it through all of this uh, pathway. Although it's important to notice that this arrow and this arrow, see that solid line around it? That means constant water reclamation. Whereas over here, you see this dotted line? Over here in the distal tubule in the collecting duct, we're going to be reclaiming water on a variable basis. That's what the dotted line around it means. Sometimes we move it. So obviously, if we're out on a, um, let's say uh, we're stopping for beers on the way home on Friday night, and we have six and a half an hour, that's a high volume of low, low concentration urine that will be released from the body to avoid increases in blood pressure and volume, and that's going to occur over here. If, however, uh, we're uh, on an exercise binge and we didn't take enough water, we're going to be shutting down the water reclamation over here and maintaining as much water in the body as possible. We see the yellow solutes with constant reclamation being shown right here in the proximal convoluting tubule. And in fact, that continuing all the way over here, here's more constant sodium chloride and sodium and chloride uh, removal in the uh, ascending loop. So there's plenty of solute around all of these tubules. Over here, we get variable again. Sometimes solutes are removed. You can see that here, reabsorption. Here we have secretion moving it into the filtrate. And uh, things that could vary here, we, we might need sodium ions or calcium ions moved on uh, hormonal control along with uh, general other ions, acids, drugs, and toxins. Now the collecting duct is where we perform the final concentration of urine for that moment. If we're overhydrated, we're dumping water, we're underhydrated, we're uh, basically retaining water, and that is controlled by the secretion of ions and urea from this collecting duct, maintaining the osmotic balance in the uh, surrounding cells. This papillary duct leads right to the minor calyx and eventually to the major calyx and uh, to the uh, main collecting tubule inside the kidney and uh, the renal pelvis. Once two or three drops uh, are delivered there, when they eat, when you enter the renal pelvis, and the renal pelvis 
it's going to be right here in the center. You'll notice here is where that papillary duct region opens up into the minor cal cal calyx, and those calyces converge on the renal pelvis. Once you get to the renal pelvis, urine production is done. The pilogram shown here by injecting an opaque dye, we have filled the bladder and the ureters with this and penetrated up into the renal pelvis, the major calyx, the minor calyces of the first, second, third and fourth ranks in some cases are shown by this pilogram. And this is basically what you do to check for open ureters and good urine flow. Notice the close adhesion here in the lower lumbar and sacrum regions as the uh, uh, ureters descend through the abdomen. Ureters are just tiny muscular tubes. They go from the kidneys to the urinary bladder and they're managed by slits. Uh, two droplets in the kidney, three droplets are enough for peristalsis to begin pushing that so we don't encounter a lot of urine pressure building up in the kidneys. We take that immediately to the bladder. Now as the weight of that increases as we go up to 500, 600, 700, milliliters of urine, um, that produces pressure signals that tell us when to void. The constant action of the ureters, though, is assured that we're always moving the new urine into the bladder. The bladder itself is just a hollow bag. It's muscular. It can produce some movement, some pressure, and stores the urine temporarily, accumulating up to a full load. A liter is a good estimate for the size of a bladder. And uh, this is also where we saw that special epithelium that we call transitional. When the bladder is full, those outer surface cells expand out, look more columnar, although they do look kind of more kind of uh, balloon shaped than other epithelium. And when it's full, the weight of the uh, urine presses it down into a more cuboidal shape. There is a, a lot of uh, suspension, so lateral ligaments, you can see here, uh, a middle umbilical ligament to uh, suspend this because a liter of uh, water basically weighs quite a bit. Um, we can't have it pressing down on the other organs. Now, uh, the, there is a triangle created by the connections of the ureters. You can see the slits here here and here. They're coming from the ureters that you see at the top of the diagram, ducking down behind and producing these openings. And then a reinforced triangle leading to this uh, urethral sphincter at the base of the bladder. This is called the trigone, and it basically uh, reinforces the positioning and connection of those ureters to the bladder. And you can see that it uh, um, also then acts as a kind of a funnel uh, down to the urethra, the final conducting tube that will take it out of the body. Oh, oh obviously that is a male diagram because the urethra is surrounded by a prostate gland, which females do not have. We can see the male anatomy again here, emphasizing the long urethra. So from the bladder, we basically come through the prostate and the urethra has to extend all the way to the tip of the penis. That's a relatively long path. And this opening, and, and just to remind, openings in the body must be protected. They have to be closed when not in use. They have to be, they, it's best if they're controlled by some kind of sphincter. It is wonderful if you have uh, pro, uh, protective cells, like white blood cells in the area, uh, in order to cut down on infection and invasion. But in the male, this long pathway is a urogenital tract. So rather than releasing the urine individually, it combines with this tube 
which is connecting to the vas deferens, coming around here through other glands to make the semen, and this pathway is the delivery uh, pathway for semen during uh, ejaculation, during reproduction. But kind of going back to this opening, it's sitting away from the body, it's not enclosed in the body cavity or between the thighs, it's in a position that's relatively dry, it's relatively bright, and it's, uh, uh, compared to the core temperature of the body, relatively cool. So this is a more difficult place for bacteria to establish, and this pathway is, is very narrow and it's long, and it's being flushed with a basic uh, toxin on a regular basis. So urinary infections are very difficult to accomplish in males because of this long pathway. In the female, that situation does not exist. Oh, one thing I want to also point out, that the separation of the urinary opening from the uh, rectal vent, the anus, is a, a long expanse of dry skin. And there's this barrier, the scrotum that's hand, hanging here. So the most ready source of regular bacterial passage is here. And there's such a long pathway, it's, it's kind of difficult to get it out here to a, this potential point of entry. I had to say that because the urethra in the female is very short from the bladder downward. Um, it extends to the vestibule of the um, between the labia, major and minor. And so this opening is relatively dark because it's right at the base of the pelvic cavity. It's relatively warm. And because it's enclosed in two sets of lips, it's relatively moist. It is also very close to the anal vent. As a result of this, um, uh, uh, the pathway for bacteria to occupy this general a region and cause um, urinary infections is uh, much more easy to achieve. So the presence of urinary infections in female is much more frequent because of the anatomy. When we release uh, urine, we call it micturation. Micturation is triggered after about, after a, a bladder is about half full and uh, the reflex causes us to relax some voluntary sphincters and basically allow gravity to push that water out. It comes out readily in a young person, a normal uh, pathway. However, urinary problems do develop. Incontinence uh, is what we call the loss of control over urine release. This happens if sphincter muscles lose tone so that we're no longer able to control them as precisely. So things like that affect that, uh, like stroke, or damage to the cerebral cortex in the right region, or damage to the hypothalamus, or the uh, mental, uh, the neural uh, central nervous system degradation that occurs with Alzheimer's, all of those factors can produce incontinence and leaking. There's an additional problem that occurs in males as they age, this prostate gland, which encloses the urethra, begins to swell and it compresses the urethra and eventually in older age can completely close it. So uh, through most of the intermediate conditions and, and most males suffer this, you know, basically beginning in their 50s and early 60s where their urine flow slows down, their ability to void their bladder uh, gets less and less. And the reason is this, uh, when your bladder is draining, the pressure from the prostate, when you get now down to 500 or 400 mils, the pressure from the prostate is sufficient to close that urethra. So even though your bladder is still half full, you do not, uh, are not able to release more urine. Um, so the rest of this, um, PowerPoint <clears throat> was added uh, when I was considering, a, I guess, a, a much more detailed approach. Uh, some of these additional uh, figures will explain the particular exchanges in the different regions 
of the nephron, the functional unit of the kidneys. Now, one of the things that, that you know, every one of them, these have wonderful lessons, but the primary detail and the primary lessons for uh, this chapter have, have now been covered. I just want you to kind of go through and look at some of these other details. Uh, we, you remember when we did tissues and we looked at the kidney tubules and talked about simple cuboidal epithelium. Here, the cuboidal cell is forming both the outer surface of the tube and the inner surface of the tube. And look at all of those villi, those uh, finger-like projections to increase the surface area. This proximal convoluted tubule uh, is uh, basically where the filtrate has just been completed in glomerulus. It comes out, water comes out, and uh, uh, substrates um, uh, like glucose, like calcium, magnesium, those things that are valuable, that are small, they are immediately eliminated. And because this is a constant high pressure flow, the uh, passive materials and even the active transport are constant to make sure we don't lose valuable things in our urine. Notice here there's a variable solute reabsorption uh, or secretion also going on in the proximal tube. Um, transport activities and the specificity. I, this slide should reinforce in your mind the specific nature of ion or molecular movement inside the human body. It requires a specific mechanism and a specific cellular and or uh, a carrier of condition. So what we're seeing here are transport activities in the proximal convoluted tubule. And uh, what we're uh, basically illustrating, uh, here we have the tubular fluid where hydrogen ion to carbon dioxide and water are being maintained. Notice that water is flowing out by osmosis and being reclaimed uh, around the peritubular capillaries. CO2 is transported out. Carbonic acid here in the uh, cuboidal cells. Hydrogen ion is generated, which can be secreted back into the tubular fluid. Hydrogen ion from the um, from the bloodstream can also be moved on a variable basis. I mean, why do we talk about all those? Because this basically summarizes the conditions of our day. If we got up and we drank water for breakfast, if we ate a, a well-balanced uh, but not particularly challenging diet, then uh, hydrogen ion transport and acid urine is probably not necessary. But However, if by noon we'd stopped at a quick trip twice and gotten two big gulps and put 88 ounces of pH 2 soda pop in our uh, bloodstream, then a lot of hydrogen ions flowing down this capillary and this transport mechanism opens up wide. Here's the reclamation you can see of sodium being moved by reabsorption, by diffusion, uh, into the uh, cells and transported by counter-transport. Do you notice this counter-transport pump with three sodium out and two potassium in? This is that sodium-potassium pump and providing these intercellular spaces with plenty of sodium to basically be absorbed as needed into the blood. Glucose and other organic molecules are shown basically leaving this uh, by, by specific carriers, by diffusion, since it's high in the um, <clears throat> initial filtrate, but it's transported out to the cells surrounding in the proximal convoluted tubules. And then on a variable basis, if this glucose exceeds the amount of glucose that these cells need, they're transported out. Uh, this is showing a uh, reabsorption of glucose to the intracellular spaces and eventually back into the blood. So sodium and chloride transport, since these are our main ions, uh, they, they depend on co-transport carriers as well as exchange pumps. 
you'll notice chloride, especially the tubular fluid, is uh, diffusing by reabsorption into these cells and then being transported with, co-transported with potassium. Both of these are moved together through a potassium pump that site is able to cycle this potassium back and under variable conditions of hyperkalemia, return it to the urine. Um, so just to reiterate, sodium chloride along the ascending limb is the main transport mechanism. And what this figure has, look at this, the osmotic pressure, 300 milliosmoles per liter, summarizes a low osmotic pressure, but as water is removed, the osmotic pressure increases to 1200. Then, so we've removed the water as we come down here. As we go back up, we're specifically removing the sodium and chloride by uh, co-transport mechanisms. And so you'll notice the milliosmoles decrease as we ascend. Permeability characters of the loop and of the collecting duct tend to be variable. They tend to concentrate urea in this tubular fluid as a way of producing a very, very high osmotic pressure. That osmotic pressure then is available so that if you open up a water channel, that water just gets sucked right out by osmosis and you concentrate your urine. You don't have ADH present, closes down those channels, the water has no choice but to flow on through in dilute form. So to kind of wrap up today, I just want to uh, ask, you know, I would ask a personal, uh, a, a, an individual question if we were in class, how many of you have ever eaten kidneys? Kidneys are considered a, um, a food staple in England. Steak and kidney pie is a um, typical bar food that they make in London and uh, other places in the British Empire. And, if you ever buy beef kidneys or pork kidneys and bring them home to cook them, uh, every recipe I've ever seen is interesting. Uh, boil the kidneys in seven changes of water, which means you put them in cold water, put them in a great big pan, boil it, throw that water down the drain, replace it with fresh water, and do that seven times. What you're actually doing is from this intertubular tissue, you're boiling out all of the urine and all of the uh, other solutes that are present and trying to get down just to the cellular content of the kidney, which when clean actually is a very firm organ. It's, it's kind of chewy. You have to cook it well. Um, most of the dishes I've seen, you they cube it up for you so that it's not too much to chew. Um, it also has a, a strong dish taste, uh, not unlike liver. Uh, it always reminded me somewhat of liver, but uh, very, very nutritious and very valued by predators um, uh, as one of those organs that it's good to eat. So, that's the end of uh, our second lecture on urinary systems.